Welcome to another Eternal Return Tips video. Today, we're going to be talking about some newer mechanics that have been changed over time and have been introduced into the game, as well as go over some more of the basic stuff that everybody should know in Eternal Return. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. The first thing I want to talk about today is all about crafting and looting in Eternal Return. Everybody needs to know how to do it, so let me try and make it a little simple. Your build, your save plan, all that stuff, I want you to think of it kind of like planning a barbecue. Now, what I mean by that is that when you're planning out a barbecue, you're going to need to go to a bunch of different stores in order to get, you know, grills, meat, vegetables, drinks, plates, all sorts of stuff. And it's basically the same thing as your save plan here in Eternal Return. You'd have to go to several stores and pick up several different things, and then when you put it all together, you got a nice cookout. But until then, you really don't have a lot going on. And it's the same thing in Eternal Return. In Eternal Return, you need to hit a bunch of different zones that have all the things on your shopping list, and until then, you are going to be pretty weak. So since your save plan is sort of serving as your shopping list for your build, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be following your route that's in your save plan, going to all of those locations and grabbing anything with a yellow triangle on the material. Obviously, if you ever see something in your quick craft bar with that yellow triangle, that means you need to craft it for your build, so you should do that immediately to get that stuff out of your inventory, or at least condense it down into uh, smaller materials. But for the most part, each location you go to is like a different store. And finally, once you've collected everything on your route, you are good to go. But in the metaphor here, the party isn't actually going to be people you're hanging out with. It's everyone else on Lumia Island who you're trying to kill to get first place. So maybe that's where it uh, falls apart just a little bit. Now, this next thing I want to talk about is just a really quick keybind. Press F8 on your keyboard when you're in game to enable the overlay. This overlay is extremely valuable for seeing information at a glance while you're playing the game. And it lets you evaluate fights a little bit easier without having to open up the scoreboard. What you'll be able to see is the weapon mastery of the people that you see on your screen, which means it's easy to evaluate their power from a distance. Also, it kind of helps you see all sorts of timers as well as locations of boxes around you in case you're having trouble distinguishing what is a lootable container and what is not. We've talked about consoles before in Eternal Return, but they've been updated over time to be more obvious when an enemy or an ally currently has the console accessed. For those of you who do not know what the console is, it's this little thing in the middle of every single zone that gives you access to these security cameras all over the zone, giving you essentially free vision in random entrances to the zone. Whenever an ally, this is either you or if you're playing a team mode, one of your teammates controls the console and nobody else, no enemies, no nothing, the console will have a green light. Now, if an enemy controls the console, the cameras will be red. They'll have a red light on top of them for the next three minutes or so. And finally, if there's no light on top of the console whatsoever, that means nobody has accessed it in the last three minutes. And that means it's probably an empty zone that no one's been to, so it might be a safe location to go. Keep in mind, you can see console colors through the fog of war. So if you're looking to teleport into a zone and you're not sure if it's safe or not, a good thing you can do is go check it out in the fog of war, see if it's currently red or not. If the cameras are red, that means someone might have been there recently or is there right now. So to reiterate, green means it's just you. It's completely safe. No one here has the vision. If it's red, there's a good chance an enemy is able to see you. The next thing we're going to talk about is going to be objectives. So objectives in Eternal Return can be divided into two categories. The first category is harvestable objectives like Tree of Life and Meteor. The other category is boss objectives like Alpha and Omega and Wickaline. Let's start with the trees. Tree of Life is a neutral harvestable objective that spawns two of them in Hotel and Cemetery at the start of Day 1 Night, and two more will spawn in Forest and Hospital at the start of Day 2 Night. So with a total of four trees, these are rare materials that are used for crafting some of the most powerful gear in all of Eternal Return. They are hotly contested and very often fought over by a variety of different characters on different build routes. Now, as for meteorites, a total of four will be spawning on Lumia Island over time at the end of every day slash night cycle in either school, temple, alley, pond, or factory, completely random between those five zones. Keep in mind, since the spawn location of the meteor is random between these five zones, 
you'll be notified a minute before it lands where it's going to be going. So be paying attention to the chat if you're trying to get a meteor at any point in the game. Also, it will be showing an indicator on the map, so keep an eye on that as well. As for the boss objectives that you can contest, there are three you should know about. And let's talk about Alpha, Omega, and Wickaline. Starting first with Alpha. Alpha is a mid-low tier android objective that spawns at the start of day two morning. Alpha can only spawn in uptown alley or factory, always in the same location within those zones. It tells you which zone he's going to be spawning in a minute before he spawns, and he always drops some mithril and some recon drones, the mithril being the most important part of his loot table. As Alpha is the only 100% mithril drop in the entire game, this is a very contested mid-game objective for players and characters who really need to use mithril. Omega is pretty similar to Alpha, except he's just like slightly a different color. He spawns in the same zones, and he spawns a whole day later at day 3 morning. However, unlike Alpha, he is a lot stronger, deals way more damage, has way more HP, and has a couple of extra bonuses for killing him, as well as a better loot table. Omega always drops a Force Core and EMP drones. Additionally, when you kill Omega, you'll be regenerating some HP and SP, as well as some of your timer. Now, as far as I'm aware, Omega is the only neutral objective in the game that gives you back timer for killing him, so it makes it a little less risky to run into a red zone to try and kill him, if he happens to spawn in a restricted area. And now finally, let's talk about Wickaline, the main boss of Lumia Island. Wickaline spawns on day three night. Wickaline chases her opponents very aggressively and randomly wanders around the map with a slight pattern based on which zones are restricted. Wickaline always spawns in the research center on the side that is right closest to Avenue. So generally speaking, if Avenue is open, the way you farm her at her spawn is right at that entrance between Research Center and Avenue. If she spawns surrounded by restricted areas, she will attempt to just go to the nearest non-restricted area and tends to stay in non-restricted areas the entire time she's alive. Wickaline is highly dangerous, deals a ton of damage, and is insanely tanky, but if you kill her, you get a really nice buff that gives you true damage bleeds on all of your damage. Additionally, you will always get a VF blood sample and two first aid kits. So with all of those neutral objectives out of the way, let's talk about supply boxes. So supply boxes have been reworked over time. They used to be kind of not important. No one really cared about supply boxes. No one was opening them because they contained random materials that they didn't care about. But they are now extremely valuable and I would go after them pretty much every chance that I get as long as I'm not doing something else at the moment. Green supply boxes always, 100% of the time now, contain food or food ingredients. What that means is it's very easy if you're in a pinch and you need something to snack on, you're probably going to get some low tier food out of it or heated oil, boiling water, heated rocks, things like that. Materials to make really good food. The next tier up, blue boxes are actually pretty similar. Blue boxes, it feels like around 80 to 90% of the time, contain really good food. Generally around 600 to 733 in quality, can even go all the way up to Zen Vitalities at around 850. So yeah, blue boxes are a great resource. Also, you can get some rare materials out of them like mithril and meteorites. Generally speaking, blue boxes are also just totally worth opening. And all the way up to purple boxes, purple boxes contain extremely rare materials fairly often like force cores and VF blood samples. Additionally, they specifically tailored the loot pool of purple boxes to try and contain items built out of rare materials like mithril gear as well as uh, armor and all sorts of accessories and stuff that are generally more niche and tailored towards countering specific playstyles like Battlesuit, Amazonas, or Lunar Embrace that are all anti-amp stuff. So if you need to find transition pieces to deal with specific matchups, you might find that niche gear over in a purple box. And of course, gold boxes are the strongest of all the boxes we've mentioned so far. They always contain a gold piece of gear, any sort of armor, chest piece, helmet, accessory, all sorts of stuff. You can rip a sanguine gun by and it'll totally change your build for the better. There's all sorts of great stuff in there, so you should definitely crack them every chance you get. They are an actual objective to fight over. So now that you're sold on all these boxes that you're gonna be uh, pulling great food and equipment out of, let's talk about a team mode specific mechanic. Let's talk about reviving. Reviving was added to Eternal Return and I'm actually a huge fan of it. The way you revive your teammates in this game is by going up to their fully dead corpse, 
checking out their body and clicking the thing that gives you their regeneration cuff. After collecting the regeneration cuff, it'll have an item in your inventory that you have to bring to one of three revive stations, either in hotel, dock, or hospital. Once one of these three revive stations is used, it cannot be used by any other team for the rest of the game, so there's only three revives allowed per match. Reviving will notify everyone on the map that a revive station has been used, and the indicator will leave the map, so people kind of have a pretty good idea of where the revive was. It's very dangerous, it's very risky, but hey, it's the cost that comes with such a powerful tool. You get your teammate back in the game, which you couldn't do before. Now lastly, I want to talk about one of the biggest changes ever put into the game, which is the Split Final Zone. Currently, Split Final Zones are only found in solos, but there's been some talk of them being added into team modes in the future, so it's worth knowing this no matter what. What a Split Final Zone is, is that at the end of a game, when there's only one non-restricted area left in the map, that area will be divided into two smaller squares that are the only safe locations in that area. When you are the only person standing in one of those two final zones, you will not lose timer on your restricted zone time. However, if anyone else joins you in one of those squares, your timer is going to tick down regardless of whether or not you're in the square because someone else is contesting it. So what that means is that you need to fight them out or leave that square and find the other one if it has nobody in it. You might be thinking, that seems like really impossible to survive. And to a certain extent, you're kind of right. What the point of this final zone split is, is to establish the two strongest parties left in the map, and those two will eventually get their fair 1v1 at the end in the next final zone. When the split final zone is engaged, every player currently on the map gets an extra 20 seconds to their timer, so you have a little bit more leeway to work with, and after the final split zones are removed, and you go down to your just single final square in the final 1v1, everyone gets an additional 10 seconds to work with. And of course, if you only had two people left at the start of the final area, it skips the split final zone altogether and just gives you the 20 seconds initially and then 10 seconds again once you get to that final square. It sounds a little complicated on paper, but in practice, it's not all that bad. And that's going to be it for all the stuff I wanted to talk about that's been changed or modified over the last few major patches. If you found this video useful, please let me know. You know, hit me up on stream, say you had a good time watching it or it helped you learn a thing or two, or leave a comment down below. It helps me a lot and I really do appreciate it. If you have more questions about the basics of this game, I would highly recommend checking out the first two videos that I put out that are general tips for Eternal Return. Additionally, if any of your questions after all those videos were not answered, leave a comment down below and I'm sure someone else here who probably had the same question at one point can give you an answer or I'll just answer it myself. But that's going to be it for me. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you guys next time.